This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. Chris Bross is the Chief Technology Officer at Drive Savers, which specializes in data recovery and digital media forensics. Chris guides the development of new tools, technology, and techniques to recover critical user data. Since joining the company in 1995, Chris has found ways to recover data from hard drives, SSDs, and RAIDs that have suffered from abuse, neglect, floods, fire, and failure. And now, they're expanding into dead smartphones. Hello, Chris, welcome. Hello, Larry. Great to talk with you again. Well, it's Hi, good Chris. to have you back. You're always fun, and, and Mike is uh, here <laughs> checking in because uh, data is his life. Yes, it is. <laughs> Chris, I've, I re described you as a data recovery firm. How would you describe Drive Savers? Well, uh, we're both a data recovery firm and a, a forensic and e-discovery laboratory, which means we're not only producing data because you want your photos and videos back, but we're producing data and recovering data for law enforcement, legal, liability, lawsuits, and all the other L words that we talk about. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes, but let's focus on the recovery business first. Is the bulk of your recovery business coming from traditional hard disks or mobile devices? Well, excellent question. Um, it is still coming from, uh, as we call it, spinning rust. That would be uh, magnetic disk drive storage. But that uh, percentage of our business is decreasing uh, slightly, while the verticals that are increasing significantly are mobile devices and solid-state storage devices. What type of um, phone damages are most common? What kind of repairs do you have to make? Well, the two biggest uh, variables driving the need for data recovery from phones and other mobile devices are impact of the devices crushed, smashed, run over, et cetera, or liquid or environmental exposure um, to all kinds of different things. Those drive the majority of cases that we need to recover data from, but that's followed by deletion of data, corruption of the operating system, and just the unknown problems that turn phones into bricks occasionally. <laughs> Chris, you and I had a chance to talk last Monday when both of us were attending the Storage Visions Conference in Las Vegas, and you told me something then that I did not know, which is that data which is stored on an iPhone or a mobile device is encrypted. But how can you recover data from an encrypted device when you can't read the data once you've got it recovered because it's in, uh, encrypted. Walk me through this process. Sure, excellent question. And we talk about encryption a lot because encryption, well, is kind of becoming the default on a lot of devices, which is a good thing. And encryption comes in a couple of layers or flavors. It comes at the file level, where a, just a file, for example, is encrypted. It comes at the file system level, where the entire operating system and file system are encrypted. Or you have what's called full disk, or FDE encryption, where everything is encrypted at a physical layer from the actual storage media itself, whether it's platters in a hard drive, or NAND flash in a phone, or in a solid state drive. So encryption is very strong. 128-bit or 256-bit encryption um, is quite strong. Um, it's arguable from an academic perspective how breakable some encryption is. But we don't break encryption. We recover broken encrypted devices. And what I mean by that is that we need to work through the logic or the controller of a particular device and repair it or fix it or modify it so that we can still extract the data via that controller itself because the controller allows us to get access to the data in a decrypted state where we can actually recover user data files. Does that make sense? <laughs> uh, I'm still taking notes. Um, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled because in the past, when we were talking about encryption, especially for high performance applications like video editing, encryption was always something we were told not to do because it slowed everything down, anywhere from five to 20%, and we couldn't afford that performance hit. 
now you're saying almost like the encryption is built in and we don't have any control over it. And I'm confused, should I worry about the performance hit of the fact that my data is encrypted? And how do you verify that you've recovered it accurately when you don't know what's there? Sure. So you shouldn't really be concerned about the performance related to encryption anymore because we've moved encryption to silicon. When encryption was in software, it was dog slow and still <laughs> is. Uh, and performance suffers greatly. When we moved it into logic on a chip, and we did that on hard drives and on solid state drives, uh, and in fact, most solid state drives entering the market today actually have encryption built into them, the user does not perceive it because the processing that's happening at a physical layer is fast enough that it doesn't really throttle your bandwidth in any way. So to the user, you don't even know it's there and running, but it's actually protecting your data down at the physical layer. I don't think anybody knows that uh, your smartphone is encrypted. I mean, nobody knows. The NSA knows, and they want it not to happen, but uh, no, they, they, nobody knows. The thing well, that, in the, in the phone market, you know, there's two major, major players right now. You look at Apple and iOS and, and the Android devices from the 6,000 handset makers on the planet who are using that operating system. And Apple, starting with the 3GS model some years ago, actually, started including encryption. On, I mean, the iPhone 3GS is some time ago. And prior to that, they were not encrypting. They were doing some scrambling, but they weren't encrypting. Apple has, by default, had this option enabled since that time, and I assume your average user has no clue about that because right. it's always on and it's always running. Now, with Android devices, last year Google made a big claim that, hey, we're going to make sure encryption's running on all our devices too after Tim Cook from Apple talked about how locked down Apple iOS was. Well, unfortunately, Google couldn't force all of the users of Android to put hardware encryption chips in their phone. So unless you're running a Nexus device that's brand new or you're actually turning on encryption in software on your vendor of choice Android phone, you are not encrypting those devices. Hmm. So in general, those are not as encrypted as Apple devices. <clears throat> Which makes the NSA really happy. Well, you know, the good guys want to have access for the right reasons, <laughs> but the manufacturers want to protect data privacy for the users. So this is going to be an ongoing battle. Yep. Well, thinking of ongoing battles, which takes us to the courts, gets us into your e-discovery and digital forensics side of the company. Define what e-discovery is and what you guys are doing. Sure. Well, I'll de define uh, digital forensics for you first. Digital forensics is the concept of producing data as evidence. That is data that could be reproduced uh, time after time in a court of law and stand up as evidence. It used to be blood, hair, and fingerprints you know, were the evidence that we were looking for in a criminal case. Today, it's your smartphone, your Twitter feed, your LinkedIn account, your public Facebook page, and every other thing valuable about you that's sitting on the phone. So when we're talking about digital forensics, any type of storage device. It could be a heart defibrillator, a GoPro camera, a server, a phone, a watch, anything that's digital and storing data, producing it for a court of law. Now, that parlays into e-discovery, which is the umbrella industry of law firms, consultancy agencies, and, and other entities like that, that then ingest this digital evidence, sort through it, call through it, look for keywords, date stamps, things related to the event, and pull the needle from the haystack, the smoking gun evidence that they need to find, and then they produce it in the traditional discovery type of environment in a court of law. You show the other side, they show you what they've got, and that is now the electronic discovery process hmm. for legal purposes. Wow. Well, what makes this different from ordinary data recovery that you guys have been doing for years? That's an excellent question. Well, in data recovery, um, the device <laughs> where the data lives isn't functioning. So that's why they're requiring data recovery. In digital forensics, oftentimes the device is operating properly, but law enforcement or whoever acquires the device from the suspect doesn't have the ability or the technology to process it. Now, there are cases in the forensic space 
where the bad guy intentionally does all kinds of bad things to a device to try to make it unrecoverable, shooting it with a gun, smashing it with a hammer, throwing it into a pond, whatever the case may be. And in those cases, you have to first do your traditional laboratory data recovery work, and then with the paper trail, the auditing and the process, produce it forensically as evidence. Are you it's being a good asked... TV show, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. They it would. A... I mean, I'd watch it. Well, there, there is a TV show. It's called CSI Cyber. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, the only difference between what they do and what we do is it's real in our lab. <laughs> <laughs> are, are your typical clients law firms? Are your typical clients individuals or corporations? Who's asking for these services? Sure. Our typical client is absolutely anyone and everyone storing data digitally on a device who's not backing it up. Um, In-house, we say from grandma to government. Well, that certainly covers the waterfront, but <laughs> I was more specifically asking about the digital forensics. Who are your typical clients here? Yeah, understood, of course. Well, law enforcement is coming to us quite often, um, both uh, domestically and internationally, with requests for devices that they can't deal with. So we see it from that side. Uh, we also see it from the attorneys in the law firms. Uh, we also see it from district attorneys who are already involved in a case. Uh, and in some cases, we see it from uh, HR attorneys in corporate America because, uh, you know, the legal departments in corporate America are trying to do a good job of watching their employees. And corporate espionage is a very, very real thing. And when employee A moves from one company to its competitor, uh, company A wants to know what that person took with them. And so that's a big part of what we do. Your website uses two terms I want to have you define. One is legally defensible, and the other is repeatable. Now, it sounds to me like those have specific meanings, and I was wondering if you could go into that for just a minute. Yeah. it's. Um, I'll, I'll try not to go down the rabbit hole on this because it becomes quite a discussion related to solid state drive and phone recovery versus traditional hard drive recovery. What I mean is that with traditional spinning hard drives, it was relatively easy to produce what we call a physical layer image of the drive in a hashed format, which is kind of a CRC check on the drive, that we could do over and over and over and reproduce the exact same results and show a judge that the evidence is solid, the, the, the digital trail is clean, and we can reproduce those results five times in a row. Now, with the move to solid-state technology, and without getting into all the physics of NAND flash with you right now, NAND flash as a media um, does not manage data in the same way, and in fact, through its own maintenance routines, gets rid of old data. Um, not for security reasons, but for performance reasons. So courts are now starting to have to adopt new standards of understanding of how we can produce or reproduce evidence from a solid state drive, which is changing its state after data has been removed from it and still prove to the judge and prove to the jury that the evidence is clean even though we can't do the same reproducible hashed image that we used to do with a hard drive, but now we have other variables that we can wrap in to show that it's clean evidence from both solid state drives and from phones. And this story will be on CSI Cyber next week. <laughs> I'm not sure if truth is stranger than fiction, but yes, it, it may be. I watch it. <laughs> Chris, this is fascinating stuff. Where can people go on the web to learn more about the kind of projects you do and the work that you do that's available to them? Sure. Well, um, you can find us on the web, obviously, at drivesavers.com. You can also find us uh, for our e-discovery services at drivesaversediscovery.com. Um, we're open 24 hours a day, 800-440-1904. We're all over social media. And uh, if you go look today on the web and search uh, Star Trek and Drive Savers, you'll see a great story about how we just helped Gene Roddenberry, who passed away in 1991. Thanks, to Chris. To recover lots of original stuff for him. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris.
If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from The Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.